here is an absolutely splendid spot to read and um, sometimes you can stop down on the beach other times on a day like this gentle southerly breeze which we're slightly in the lee of this hill to protect us from uh, it's nice to climb up here lol on the grass and uh, discuss Central Asia. Now, Central Asia is a dry place. This is not a dry place. Water, water everywhere at sea level and uh, half the year it's uh, above sea level. In other words, anywhere below cloud level. So, today's book is called Russia and Central Asia and subtitled Coexistence, Conquest, Convergence. It's by Shoshana Keller, who works in a liberal arts college, as she puts it, and uh, it was published earlier this year, so it's, it's right up to the minute. Essentially, the book tells a story of how a conquering empire developed into a remarkable example of a multicultural, semi-tolerant one, which was then destroyed, essentially, by Stalin. One of the really interesting aspects of the Russian Empire, not the Soviet Empire, but the pre-1914 Empire, was that its remarkable tolerance, I think partly due to just simple easy goingness, but its remarkable tolerance for all the different peoples of the Empire. I've got an absolutely beautiful book of photographs by the famous photographer Pradukin Gorky, who um, travelled all over, he was one of the first and most famous photographers of Russia and he travelled all over um, on the railways in the immediate, in the sort of decade before the First World War and took some absolutely fantastic photographs and he, you see in these photographs, he goes to Central Asia, one of his trips, there's nine of them I think, goes to Central Asia and the colourfulness and the carpet traders in Bukhara and the uh, the herdsmen in Kazakhstan living in what the Americans have called an adobe hacienda um, and so on and so on and so on. It's, it, it's, a, it's a fantastic sight. And Russia was a very colourful place. There were the Buryats, there was the Kyrgyz, there was the Kalmyks, there were the Jews, there were Mordvians, there were Chukchis, there were Khantimansis, etc, 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 etc. There was just I mean, I think well over a hundred really identifiable nationalities. And the empire, so long as people basically didn't try and subvert it, the empire kind of let them carry on in a way which the, the British Empire did to a certain extent, but that was all away from home. In Russia, this was sort of at home as well. I mean, Russians would go to Central Asia for holidays. They'd certainly go to the Caucasus, places like that and they go hunting and fishing in Siberia and so on. So, you know, the same way they did in Scotland here, but um, the struggles that this part of the world, the old highlands, had to retain any kind of uh, individuality within Britain are very significant, very uh, important in terms of the trying to assess the cultural diversity of, of Britain and Russia was f really far 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 more diverse and an awful lot was lost by the revolution as we will discuss here. So I think it's a very interesting subject and it's very apposite today because it, it was a genuinely multicultural empire and this book is about how Russia took over Central Asia and administered it on a pretty rough and ready basis. I mean, they weren't, um, there was no touchy feely stuff. It was, but it was, it was something that, like the British Raj, to a large extent tolerated cultural difference as long as the overall project wasn't challenged. It's um, very much an academic book, and honestly, it's written in a slightly dull way. The chapters all have an introduction, a body of the chapter, and a summary. You know, I can tell you what I'm going to say, then I'm going to say it, then I'll tell you what I've just said. And I find that really pretty tedious. It's got a rather dead style. It doesn't invite you to come and enjoy 
the culture and, and uh, interest of Central Asia. Nonetheless, it's, the prose is quite easy to read. It's not, I, I don't want to be too hard on the lady. Um, it, there's one very good feature of this book, and that is it's got some fantastic maps in it. And the maps, because of anybody who's not familiar with Central Asia, which I'm not particularly, um, is it's very helpful. And she, she uses them well. She, to, you know, the names that are in the text appear in the maps. And so you can, you can find your way around. It's got a computer-generated index, one of my bit more, but anyway, there it is. Um, and it's got a couple of um, revealing mistakes, so it's not perfect. Uh, the, the, the one particular one that I thought was, was, re was revealing is on page 163, where she says that Lenin, when he got ill, in December 1922, he, Lenin, had, had a stroke that weakened him considerably. He tried to remain active in the leadership, but he was isolated for the sake of his health in a dacha in Gorky, in brackets now Nizhny Novgorod, with limited contact, etc. Well, I've been to his dacha in Gorky, and it's in the suburbs of Moscow, and it's Leninsky Gorky, it's known as now, and it's a big museum, which includes one of the most fascinating exhibits of that time that I've seen, and that is the Tsar's six-wheeled half-track Rolls-Royce, which Lenin commandeered to use in the winter. It's in the basement of this amazing house that, uh, that, uh, that, they, that Lenin lived in. But it's nothing to do with Nizhny Novgorod. Nizhny Novgorod is hundreds of miles from Moscow. Uh, this is clearly somebody whose experience of Russia is, is more through books than actual travel. And probably that is why the colour doesn't come through to the same extent. So, with those preliminary points having been made, I'm going to make three basic points, and they're the three periods of Central Asian history. They're the Tsarist period, the Soviet period, and the post-Soviet period, which um, she doesn't go into as much as I would have liked, to be quite honest, but I don't think that, I don't blame her for that, it's, it's unknown territory. And also, as she points out, and this is very interesting, the, the, uh, many of those countries are closing their archives and I don't know about restricting access but certainly making it none, no easier than it was before for historical researchers. So the, uh, the last bit is an inevitable slight disappointment but the first bit is very very interesting and is in my opinion the best part of the book. In 120 pages she gives the background, and I think it's extremely well done. It's well worth reading for that alone. The whole, right from the beginning of history really, with the Mongols arriving and all the other type of um, uh, shocks and invasions and catastrophes that Central Asia suffered, they're very well told, very balanced account in my opinion of how the Russians came in and took over semi-reluctantly, a little bit like the British in Africa. I don't know about India, but certainly in Africa there was an element of the people like Gladstone, for example, trying to restrict the empire, give the colonies back to the native people, and the Boers and so on. And Russia was not quite as much as Gladstone, but he was, it was on the same track. But it's a very, very interesting history. And the thing that comes across to me in that period is that it was a real aristocracy of a sort. And by that I mean that, it, uh, that the, the upper stratum did upper stratumy things and the lower strata did lower stratumy things and they just got on with their lives. The upper strata of course administered the empire but since they had hardly anything to do with people unlike today, and this is my point, uh, unlike a modern bureaucracy they, they had an incredibly light touch on the on the daily lives of people, I mean, I wouldn't surprise me if half the Cossacks had never even heard that they lived under, never even knew they lived under a czar. This multicultural empire could flourish on that basis. And what is difficult today with multiculturalism is the fact that the state takes such a detailed interest in every single thing you do, and the state can't contradict itself. It can't allow this here and disallow that over there. That started in imperial terms with the British Empire under the influence of the missionaries in the 19th century 
basically making the argument that what is not legal in London should not be legal in Bangkok. And when that mentality infected the empire, it was doomed. And it was the missionaries who did that. The Christian evangelical missionaries who undermined the entire tolerance of the, of the empire. Now, Russia never had, or to only a trivial extent, did it, did it ever suffer from evangelical Christianity. And as a result, it remained a tolerant and very, very colourful and incredibly varied place. And Central Asia, probably more than most parts of it, was also the Caucasus, also Siberia, and of course northwestern Europe, between the pre baltic and Finland and Poles and so on and so on. And Russia, of course, itself, and Ukraine, goes on. So, the sad thing, reading the first part of this book, is seeing, is, is getting to the um, revolutionary period and realising that it's bureaucracy that destroys multicultural empires. And the problem is confronted um, very explicitly by Lenin. Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels taught that all proletarians all over the world would seize control over factories, land and other means of economic production. Then, because nations were the product of capitalist economic processes, proletarian class solidarity would override national loyalty and nations would cease to exist. Yeah, I mean, I think the uh, Ponty Python workers control of factories uh, formulation is slightly more succinct. But anyway, we then get on to the heart of the matter. Lenin, she says, and this is absolutely right, like most of this, this is an accurate account as far as I can see. Lenin hated the idea of grafting nationalism onto Marxism and commissioned a young Georgian Bolshevik named Joseph Jugashvili, writing under the nom de guerre Kuba Stalin, to write a counter-argument. Stalin's essay, Marxism and the National Question, would provide the theoretical basis for a profound reshaping of Central Asia after the Bolsheviks took power. Now, I don't know if anybody's ever read that thing. I've looked at it. I haven't read the whole thing because it's unreadable. But it is, it is so obvious this is bureaucracy arriving. It has the bureaucratic trick of never committing itself. It says this and that and quotes people and it's all in slightly vague terms with, I don't know whether he thought of this at the time, but certainly later on Stalin used texts like that to say, oh, you didn't agree with this aspect of what I said. And uh, somebody then is shot. Then it goes to the other side and says, oh, you didn't agree with that aspect of what I said, so they're shot. And in other words, it's loosely enough phrased that it gives the opportunity for almost anything to be believed, like, you know, not unlike the Bible. So, Shoshana Keller goes on to say, and I think this is extremely important, early Bolshevik nationality theory makes a neat package. Communist revolution will be a global revolution. But national minorities that have been oppressed by Russians have good reasons to be suspicious of a revolution led by Russians. In order to allay these suspicions, the revolution guarantees the right of national self-determination to all peoples who fit Stalin's definition of a nation. Now, what is so interesting about this, quite aside from it being a, an important summary of the historical approach to um, to nationalities that the Bolsheviks took and, and which had tremendous consequences. It is also reflects the EU today and Scotland because the same, the same balance between apparently favouring nations and actually trying to undermine them is what we see in Brussels today. When Stalin wrote um, Marxism and the National Question. No one, least of all Stalin and Lenin, expected a revolution any time soon. I therefore slightly puzzled why he wrote it in the way he did, or maybe that's his natural way of thinking, refusing to be too definite. But then she goes on to say, a mere four years later, Lenin named Stalin his commissioner, of co his commissar of nationalities in the new government, and together they began to apply theory to the real world. Soon after seizing power, they issued a proclamation that promised national self-determination. 
including the right of nations to secede from the Bolshevik state. Very important. The Lisbon Treaty had the right of nations to secede from the EU. You tried doing it, as we know in Britain now. Uh, it's a very different matter. The same, the same in, in uh, the USSR, although probably even worse matter. But I think it's a very interesting... The, the changeover from the Tsarist, uh, loosely administered, sort of tolerant, tolerantish, not too tolerant at the higher levels, but the lower levels pretty tolerant, maybe, maybe indifferent is a better word, uh, way of running things to the Bolshevik um, situation where everybody had to subscribe to the latest theory that was emanating from the Kremlin and it really became an internal empire. The Tsarist, the Tsarist empire was really a kind of external empire. But it was turned into an internal empire by the, by the Bolsheviks. And the thing that turned it into the internal empire was the fact, the introduction of massive, intrusive bureaucracy. Of course, the, the Tsarist empire was run very bureaucratically, but it was run at a very arm's length, on a very arm's length basis, rather as the British empire was. So when the Bolsheviks took over, they suddenly introduced this sort of Germanic system, if you like, Germanic um, sort of uh, general staff approach to running the country, which still persists, and I'm afraid that is the, the thing that differentiated the old regime from the new regime and destroyed the freedom of all these people to be different. And Shoshana Keller makes the point at the beginning of the chapter on the Stalin era. The Communist Party's forced sedentarization of Kazakh nomads alone killed approximately one and a half million people, probably about a quarter of the population. The women's liberation campaigns, the near elimination of Muslim clergy and the political purges of the mid-30s destroyed hundreds of thousands more lives. So that's where the story got ugly. And she traces these developments very well. I, I think, to be honest, in the Soviet bit, there's arguably a little bit too much detail about population numbers and who moved here and there. But it really, it's a, it's a very interesting story. And on the whole, I would say very well told. She makes the point, um, which I never really thought about before, and I suspect probably has quite a, has quite a lot of truth in it, because the historian. Uh, the average Western historian concentrates so much on Russia and so little on the outlying parts of the empire that we tend to think of the uh, revolution as starting with the Petrograd bread marches um, at the end of February 1917. Due to losses on the Western Front, or as it was the Russian Western Front, the, the army was short of manpower and they decided to extend conscription to Central Asia. Prior to that, people had a very loose relationship with the Soviet state, and one aspect, they could sort of do what they like, they didn't get much provision from the state, and one aspect of that was they weren't conscripted into the army. They decided to change that. Now, this mirrored exactly the debate in Britain about extending conscription to Ireland. And, as we all know, it was the, it was the 1916 Easter uh, Rising and the subsequent proposal was never implemented, to extend conscription to Ireland that really provoked the rebellion there and the beginning of the breakup of the British Empire. Exactly the same thing happened in Russia. And uh, Dr. Keller says, the unravelling and collapse of the Russian Empire began here when Kazakhs and Kyrgyz exploded in rage after decades of settler encroachment. As in Turkestan, the violence began with angry crowds lynching local officials charged with implementing the draft. Within about six weeks, fighting groups organised themselves in the steppe to attack Russian telegraph and railroad lines and Russian villages. You know, attacking ascendancy estates and uh, RUC, RIC posts, you know, much the same thing. This was open anti-colonial warfare, and the Russian military and settlers responded with savage violence of their own. In the area of Simirechi, around Lake Isik-Kul, Kyrgyz, that's in the eastern mountainous part of 
of uh, the area. Kyrgyz and Slavic settlers fought to exterminate each other, both sides using terror against civilians as a major weapon. Early Kyrgyz attacks killed 3,500 settlers and in reprisal Russian troops systematically slaughtered Kyrgyz. By the fall of 2016, it was long before bread riots in Petersburg, Petrograd, I should say. By the fall, hundreds of thousands of Kyrgyz with their animals and households were fleeing across the Tian Shan Mountains into China. Winter had come early in 1916. The passes were slippery with snow and food was scarce. At least 200,000 Kyrgyz died of cold, hunger and rush. I'll just end this little bit by quoting the next paragraph, which is extremely interesting in a slightly different way. It shows how the Russian uh, the Petrograd leadership mismanaged these people in much the same way that the English imperial authorities mismanaged the Irish situation after the Easter Rising and, and so on. For some nomad aristocrats, the insult was, was not in being drafted, but in being drafted to dig ditches rather than fight. The Central Asians were not um, put readily into combat roles. Kanat Abukin was a Kyrgyz prince who had been born in the semi Rechi in 1856, making him 58 years old when the war broke out. He had worked with Russian officials for years in his capacity as a village chief, but watched the lives of his people worsen as settlers moved in. In 1914, he and his son tried to enlist in the army and were upset when they were refused. In August 1916, Abukin dictated a letter to Russian authorities on behalf of a group of Kyrgyz men who were willing to fight for the Tsar in positions that accorded with their sense of dignity. Rejected again, in October Abukin was captured while leading his people into China. The Russians hanged him in January as a supposed leader of the entire uprising. Now that, to me, has an awful lot of parallels with the British uh, approach to Ireland in the time of the, the second half of the First World War. Right, I'm going to now just mention one little bit about the post-Soviet uh, situation. It, it, it illustrates one of the wisest things said about this kind of history that I'm aware of. And that was said by Stephen Kotkin, the absolutely brilliant biographer of Stalin. It's a very different view from the accepted one and it's utterly fascinating and I've heard him talk many times and he's just an interesting guy and his basic point is, he's a great commentator on post-Soviet Russia as well, and his basic point is this, communism is over but fascism isn't. And the reason for that is that communism ostensibly offers leaders nothing more than equality with the workers not very attractive once you've got into the kind of positions that all the Soviet satraps had in Central Asia by the time of Brezhnev. But fascism, which offers you, you know, all the, all the sort of Yanukovych-style um, elite trappings of life in, that Putin enjoys in Medvedev in Adintsevo and places like that, that's not over. And that is roughly the story of what's happening in Central Asia in Shoshana Keller's account. And here is an extremely important rule of law point. And this is the last bit I'm going to uh, trouble you with. She says, this is page 249, she says, Western style democracies depend on the rule of law that regulates checks and balances among power centers. These concepts, much less in their realization in practice, were alien to most Central Asians. It is likely that Akayev's political pluralism lasted as long as it did because Kyrgyzstan was so poor that it depended on Western financial aid and the price of Western aid is at least surface conformity with democratic legal norms. However, while communist ideology evaporated pretty quickly, Kotkin's point, established Soviet Central Asian political practice was stronger than the newfangled Western standards second half of Kotkin's point. Local elites had their own norms that had worked well for them for decades in the Soviet Union. It would have taken much more than economic development aid to persuade those elites to give up their bases for economic, bases of economic and political control.
So Central Asia is slightly like Russia, but probably by this account more so, closing down again a bit. You get the feeling that in these Central Asian um, republics where, by her account, where society doesn't really have the same autonomous, organic drive that it does in Moscow and Petersburg and all the main cities in Russia. So there we are. It's a very interesting book and uh, if you want to know something about how uh, all the Central Asian countries came to being, how recently they all came to being, um, but what the long-term history is, how the Soviets destroyed the Russian Empire and how in the modern conditions the sort of Soviet power structures, which are more fascist than communist really, as we all know, uh, have taken over and, uh, and are really, you know, they're ruling the roost now. And pray to the Chinese who are coming through the East with Belt and Road plans that appeal to the leaders and don't necessarily at all appeal to the ordinary people. And that's the subject of another uh, discussion. So there we are, beautiful afternoon, absolutely glorious, and I'm going to settle down and uh, read for half an hour and then uh, toddle back down to the beach. I hope I can get down there without falling on these rather precipitous rocks.